I feel like you likely are bearing witness to uh, a high amount of low hanging fruit throughout culture that is just sitting there for the, for the picking from a, a biomechanical, really mental, emotional, sociological perspective, but particularly coming from the body. Is there, if there was like a top one, two, three, whatever comes to mind, low hanging fruit of like, if culture just started picking that fruit, it would make a difference. Is there, well, is there anything that comes to I, mind? Yes, I, you know, w- one of the things that's interesting that we are witnessing a, the biggest mismatch between environment and person ever now. And, you know, I, I think as a culture, we've become obsessed, especially now entertainment through social media, obsessed with diet and exercise as, hey, I, I want to look some fitness way. I want to be jacked. Um, but underneath that is not a conversation about durability, longevity. And I, I think that really we, we have sort of given people the leg and we're like, yeah, this is the way. And then people are keto confused. You know, every, every bro on the planet is dragging sleds now. Um, it's fantastic. <clears throat> Comma, we're leaving everyone behind. And if society or if, if science is all about trying to transform humanities, then the science of performance of human optimization has to be about transforming communities. And it's not. We're not. What we're seeing is those of us who stumbled into this because it's how we dealt with our anxiety or we got interested in lifting or running or eating a certain way, we're starting to see that cohort become further and further away from the other cohort, the rest of humanity, which has jobs and parents and, hmm. and historical ways of eating and inherited understanding of how their body works. So what we're seeing is, man, we've taken PE out of school. We don't teach kids how to eat in home ec- or cook in home ec. So food is as cheap as it's ever been in our whole lives. Calories are as cheap as they've ever been. We're not sleeping. We don't walk around because it's, it's easier to drive or, you know, the society is, is structured in a way that we have structural limitation to the things that make us human beings. And so what I would suggest for people is let's ask some simple questions. Are we more or less diabetic? Are we more or less obese? Are we having more musculoskeletal pain or less? Are we more or less depressed? Choose something you care about. Um, are we having fewer ACL injuries or more? And so suddenly what you realize is, man, we're not doing a very good job of taking care of ourselves culturally, which means we need to understand sort of what are the drivers that have gotten us here in terms of being sort of really robust humans. And there were a lot of things that used to be in, in place that you know, we had to walk to school, we only had three channels, you know, food was a little bit more simple. Um, you know, it, it, suddenly the, some of the things that were keeping the wolf at bay have changed and shifted. And suddenly what we find is we were really in a meta-stable conditioning. And meta-stability is a concept where you might have a, a, a slope of snow and all of a sudden it takes a little triggering event, boom, avalanche, even though that, that system appeared stable. We see that in the forests of um, the, the Western United States. These forests that seemed healthy are really unhealthy and primed to go off and have these massive burns because of the instability. Well, the same thing is I think is happening with humans and we're sort of accelerating and starting to see some of that. All the data suggests that you know, we're not going towards a, a healthier population and that we're going to be diabetic and really over, overweight and really unhappy and not and, and full of a lot of suffering. So what we have to do is start to think, well, it's not that people don't have access to information, but people are overwhelmed. And what we need to do is restructure where and when we begin these interve- interventions around public health. And public health isn't about necessarily more COVID testing, right? I mean, that, those are important. And everyone, we just came through a pandemic where everyone was, you know, on the sort of far left was saying, oh, we need more metabolic flexibility and people are unhealthy and that's why we're so sick. I'm like, that's really great that you're shouting that at the internet. Where are you driving change in your community and culture? How are you affecting your neighborhood? Do you have walks going on? Do you have a walking school bus? How are you changing food at your local cafeteria, at schools? Where are the structural interventions 
in our sort of you know society and daily cultural practices that are going to lead us to more robust people and that has nothing to do with diet and exercise and i think that's where we're going to have to understand what's the low-hanging fruit is well walking is free sleeping is free drinking water is free eating fruits and vegetables is free freer right i mean there, there's just there's some things that people can do you know i, I don't think a top-down approach is always the best approach. I think we have to be thinking top down, but we have to be thinking from bottom up, which means if you really want to transform society, you need to know your neighborhood and transform your neighborhood. And that's, that's yeah. the, the issue. And until we do that, we're just going to keep adding complexity into complex systems. Yeah, that's... Uh, I wish I could I give you that, that as a soundbite. Yeah, no, it's okay. I know that you're a fan of Philip, Philip Beach, as am I. Uh, Muscles and Meridians is, is one of his like main, main, main. I don't know. If, I don't actually even know if he has other books, but I really like Muscles and Meridians. Yes. And in that in that book, he describes um, spending t- certain positions that we just naturally, innately would go through in a a natural in quotations setting, uh, just historically for like the you know the the, the 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 vast majority of our history as human beings, we've had these innate movement patterns that would just naturally arise as a product of going through our, our days. Yeah, you, you toilet and on the ground, you sit on the ground, you cook on the ground, you sleep on the ground. We don't ever have yeah. to do Turkish get-ups ever. Yeah, and, 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 and so it's, he, he refers to those as, as archetypal postures of repose, you know, and describes them as, as, as like tuning mechanisms. That's right. And I think that that's, we don't need to, in, in my opinion, and I think your opinion, go into like the excessive romanticization of the past I think it's it's just how do we and this is the question how do we seamlessly begin to integrate those basic inherent tuning mechanisms that have been around like way longer than iPhones uh, or even the agrarian age and like farming and such into our modern lives you know and I think that that's the interesting thing it becomes this tribalistic thing okay it's us it's them great for sales uh, but not that great for like development of a culture yeah you know what I'm saying? I, I um I agree with that all and you know one of the things we're talking about here is hey any chance you can while you're watching TV or reading a book just sit on the ground a little bit and when you need to fidget fidget mm-hmm. away um, how do we begin to facilitate and constrain behavior so that we can have the right inputs or different inputs because I really do believe the body is a, you know, we've certainly come out of a sickness model um, mm. and still are, are there, but the body is really robust and self-tuning. You know, I use this example. You probably heard me say this. I was in Vegas teaching once and just door, the elevator door opens and this woman who's like four foot 10 and 300 pounds gets in and she's got one of those three foot Budweiser's and she's smoking and has like a bag of donuts and you know, she does not look healthy but she is stoked and feeling good and feeling no pain and is flirting me up, trying to get me to go to her room. And my <laughs> thinking in that moment is, wow, humans are really tolerant. Like we're tolerant and robust and badass and you can be ridden hard and put away wet. Uh, and maybe that's not the right image with that woman. But the idea yeah. here is, you know, we're not, we're not pansies and we're not fragile. But one of the things we're learning is that if you don't put on bone density and muscle mass in your 20s and 30s, man, it is really difficult to reclaim that. And I think simultaneously two things. One is no one is rewarded for health right now. You know, what we're, because as long as everything's, as long as you don't have pain, everything's fine enough, you know, you just kind of, you go about being entertained. And so there's, there's not a sort of, you know, who are the stakeholders in your health? And we're starting to see it in the system of, of who pays for health insurance and health in this country, which is after World War II became the employer. Employer became chief uh, insurer. And so now your body and your health, even your psychological, spiritual health, mental health, all of that is on the books of your employer. So suddenly the employers are like, whoa, we're gonna have to think differently about the environment, we're going to have to think differently about the foods we offer, how we get people to sleep at home. And simultaneously, they're like, here's a laptop. Work at home 24 hours a day. Be constantly connected. You know, um, yeah. be entertained. So we have this, this mismatch, as you're saying, um, where 
there's not really a stakeholder in terms of, of the health. And simultaneously, it's very difficult for all of us as humans to appreciate that you're probably going to be 100 years old. Really, just because of modern medical you know, services and the drugs and surgeries available to you, you know, and what we need to talk about is sort of what the quality is of your life. As Juliet and I approach 50, we're both turning 49 this year, it is very different in our minds about what we want our bodies to do. We're having more and more friends have, you know, joint replacement surgeries, health problems, people are dying suddenly, you know, from, from heart disease and some of these things. And we need to, um, again, begin to appreciate that the things that you once could get away with, you cannot always get away with. And that the experiment of being a human is an experiment that you're running in your life for a hundred years. So you don't have to play perfectly, you just have to play consistently. So then the question is, well, what does is, what is consistent play look like? Well, it's walking around my neighborhood and getting some sunshine and, and trying to maintain my native range and drink some water and, you know, and it's not, you know, I have to nail these adaptogens and get this mushroom tea and have this deadlift kettlebell, you know, flow nailed. It's really a lot more simple than that. But simultaneously, no one's set up to pay for it. The things that we've been focusing on healthcare are pain, and that's really strange. We've got all these ways to self-soothe, from opiates to alcohol to THC, plus the fact that we're going to all be 100 years old. Whew. We need to sort of reconcile what that looks like and then present it to people in a way where it can become normative behavior. And it doesn't have to be heroic, where people have always done it this way. You know, So I think that's, yeah. that's yeah. really the... Uh, you're right, the tribalism, this is my secret scroll program, it feels really good to be part of something and cool and, you know, I do this mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and look, all roads lead to Rome, but, you know, we're not, it's, the thing we're doing right now is not currently working as well as we'd like it to work. Yeah, um, I, I greatly appreciate uh, the way that your mind operates in these conversations because it's able to you're able to, to transition your aperture into the micro and then back into the macro and into the philosophical and into the anatomical. And I think that's invaluable to have that characteristic. Um, and, and so as you're, as you're speaking, I feel like, do you have something on that? Or well, you to, it felt like you were about to say something. Well, what I was going to say is eventually you realize that you have to take all of those approaches that, you know, yeah. Juliet and I worked on the micro, you know, we were working on people's feet and ankle function in our gym for 16 years. And we're like, okay, well, you know, yeah. what's the next, what's the next phase of that? And as we're becoming more mature and having more and more powerful friends and invited to sit at more and more tables, we suddenly realize, wow, that we have to have a slightly different approach to this if we're going to fulfill our promise. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, I just uh, recorded a conversation with a, a gal called Dr. Becca Levy, and she's like a Stanford professor, and um, she wrote a book recently about aging and how the stories that we tell ourselves in regard to aging um, impact our, our physiological expression in, in relation to wow. um, the, the potential of cardiovascular disease manifesting or just like all-cause mortality, just like things get a lot worse at you know, fill-in-the-blank level if you run the story at age 30 that aging is a problem and I'm just going to slowly just like, you know, pull, pull myself apart and go into entropy and like wind back into the ground. That is a, a subconscious story that's implicit in, in culture for the most part in Western culture. And it doesn't need to be, but it's very interesting to start to bridge that gap of like, wow, like so much of this, including the dogmatic tribalism between keto or CrossFit or yoga or Pilates or carnivore or vegan, it's just a bunch of stories, you know, and, and, and it, it's such a, it's such an amazing thing to, to get into that underpinning of like, okay, like there's the minutia of the details and then there's the actual container of the story that I think you know, at least based off of, of statistics from, you know, fr from aging and, and Dr. Dr. Levy, it's like, oh, wow, the story really, um, you know, it carries more weight than I think we realize. And we get kind of get lost up, lost in, in like the woods and the minutia of the details of it. That's so interesting. Um, you know, we were just listening to uh, Diana Rogers, who's Sustainable Dish, 
uh, she and Rob Wolf have written a book called Sacred Cow, looking at meat as not the problem, right, for global climate change. In fact, you know, one of the things I really like about her position is she, she takes this view that, uh, you know, when we start to pull out this nutrient-dense superfood out of the diet, we see worse outcomes for children, for people's health, et cetera, et cetera. Even, you know, and again, factory farming's not great, comma, right? She's taking this look at this cultural twist that meat is somehow bloody and dirty and clean eating veganism, you know, in spite of looking at this. And I think at the heart of this is people saying, hey, you know, I don't know what's what's working and not working, but what we're doing is not working and I'm sick. So what's what's something I can change? And in there, they make the case that how connected you are to your community and how lonely you feel directly impacts your health as much as any other thing. And one of the things that we came through with COVID was that we saw suddenly people did not have access to their, their community, did not have access to their group, were isolated, and all of their health outcomes you know, plummeted. So... Yeah. I don't remember who said it, but they're like, hey, think about the brain as a social organ. It has to be around other people. And that those loose network con connections where you shop at your local market and people are like, what's up, Kel? Or, hey, how's it going? And just those loose things, not your deep, meaningful connections with your three best friends from middle school. Those are important. More important is being in a community of people. And so when you suddenly start to parse that apart, and we're looking at trying to improve health outcomes, you have to then, you're now into architecture and you're into community design and you're into understanding why we need parks mm -hmm. and places where people can run into each other and gather. Why, yeah. uh, you know, how we have to, you know, have playgrounds at schools. And suddenly you're like, holy moly, I had to get into this to solve this health problem? Yes. And as soon as we start to look at the brain in this way, that then the container for the brain is this body and this, this whole thing, then suddenly we're a lot closer. And your gratitude journal is a really important part of that. But more important is walking in your neighborhood and saying hi. I mean, do you know your neighbors? Yes or no? And you don't even have to like your neighbors, but do you know your neighbors? Can you give them a head nod? That's almost more important than how much zone two cardio you got. <laughs> it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's bananas right now how mismatched we are, you know, kind of, you know, all sequestered up watching Netflix. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the concept, we might have even talked about it at some point, but the concept of parasitic tension, mm. which came from Moshe Feldenkrais. And that, that's the, you know, the idea that many of us, like I fall into this category, I, I kind of think you fall, have historically fallen into this category as well, based off of what, you know, just my experience with you. Um, we have learned through our, our familial, you know, origins or cultural origins uh, that we're, we're kind of like bracing for impact, mm. you know, and we're like waiting for the shoe to drop. And what that will do if some, someone raised their fist up and is about to punch you, you cause this full body global contraction. And suddenly, you know, it, like all of the physiological expressions of, of, of stress in an instant manifest themselves. And I think that if you look, uh, culturally like I, I don't remember the exact statistic but something like most people in America couldn't afford a surprise like four hundred and fifty dollar um, bill you know if like your computer breaks your cell phone breaks whatever you're at like like you're down to the bone rock bottom and what that does it's not just a socioeconomic thing it's it's a it's a physiological thing you know and, and I think oh, that yes. coming into yes. those like the you know, and, and so that's something that I think is, well, two things. One, I, I would love to understand like your experience with your own story and like your own like makeup of like how, who you think you are and how you hold yourself. And I'm sure you've gone through different levels of like revelations of like, oh, that's what it means to relax. I didn't actually know what it meant to relax before that moment 10 years ago or two months ago or, or you know, something of the sort. Um, or maybe that doesn't, doesn't relate. But I'd be curious your thoughts on that. Uh, I... You're absolutely right. When we begin to see, you know, it's almost easier to start to categorize behaviors, inputs, experiences, tonic or stressor. <laughs> does this, does this give mm -hmm. me, you know, is this, you know, restorative 
breathing, walking, sunshine, is this a stressor? Hey, I have real financial stress. And it's why we can't talk about food deserts or why certain populations in our American culture are more overweight than less overweight because we're not talking about the stress on the human back to back. And that might be socioeconomic, that might be class, that might be you know, race. We have to address all of those things. Um, yeah. You know, I'm a cis hetero white man. The, the impact that my wife has and her experience in the world is different than mine, no matter how aware I am of, of the inherent biases and sort of, you know, deck being stacked in my direction. So, you know, to your point, you know, one of the things that I think we have, Juliet hammers on all the time, is that we have certainly romanticized um, you know, stress, you know, we, we make it, it's beautiful. I pulled an all nighter. Yeah. I worked everyone. I burned every, everyone to the ground. I, you know, I've sacrificed. I mean, look at the Steve jobs documentary or the, you know, the movie, I think it's Aaron Sorkin where he doesn't have a relationship with his family and his daughters and every, you know, he built this company super cool and maybe wasn't very happy. Right. So how, and something that we, Juliet and I ask all the time is a lot of the best athletes in the world we know all grew up using trauma as a way of, uh, or using their sports as a way of coping with trauma. And I can certainly tell you, uh, reading, you know, Barack Obama's book, um, he's a single child of a mother who told him he was the chosen one. He had some innate talent and... Uh, and a lot of luck and became a, you know, a maniac. And he's like, look, I don't know, you know, what, you know, if it was the missing father figure that I didn't have or my mother or, you know, what it is that got me this drive to do, take the next step, take the next step, you know, take the next risk. But I can certainly relate to all of those things. And I think Juliet and I both can. And I think both of us have come from families where there was a lot of insecurity when we were little and a lot of unusual circumstances, which created a need and a drive to be successful, more importantly, probably to self soothe or be safe. And instead of channeling that into heroin or cocaine, Juliet and I tra- channeled it into exercise and work. And so, hmm. you know, I think we're still realizing that the, and, and this is an appropriate way of looking at this, is that the defense mechanisms, and I, I don't mean like, that's a negative, but the, the coping strategies that you've developed in results to your environment can serve you. They can be your greatest ally, but you also have to recognize when they stop serving you. And I'm pretty sure that's what uh, you know, Obi-Wan was saying to Luke, your feelings do you credit, Luke, but uh, they, you know, they'll control you. And so at some point, I think it was about 10 years ago when one of my friends said, hey, Kelly, you made it. You know, you're safe. You can, you know, you feed your kids. And, and uh, you know, I think you... Everyone that we know who has been successful usually does it at a personal cost. You know, I lost all my hair. I, you know, was not sleeping a ton to build all of this. That was, you know, and and again, Juliet and I were just go, 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 because that was what we needed. And we were, didn't want to be critically, chronically poor. And we had an incredible opportunity. The universe afforded us. And simultaneously recognizing that, you know, I think what I've come to now is this idea that, hey, you know, Kim Kardashian aside, if you really want to achieve something, you have to work really hard. But then you have to be able to hit the brakes equally hard. And I think in our society currently, we don't have, we're either not working as much as we think we are, we're busy, we're not working hard, or we need bigger breaks. And that's why I think you're seeing the rise of sauna and ayahuasca and cold. And people are like, where are the bigger rotors so that I can stop the machine? And because, as everyone knows who's listening to this potentially, the faster you go, the faster you can go. And what you start doing is just you know, shaving off aspects of your soul and yourself to, for some you know, outcome instead of saying, you know, are you at peace? Can you leave your phone behind yeah. and be quiet for a couple of days? Fortunately, Julie and I have some great great history of being on the river and being in the wilderness and training and shutting the voice off. But, you know, even my sanctuary, which used to be, you know, true exercise now with TikTok and trying to compete in these spaces to get people's attention, 
you know, suddenly that is not long, no longer as safe a space or a place where I can iterate or, you know, ideate. Yeah. I, I wonder, um, so something that I say I, in, in the whole Align uh, ecosystem, there's about five people that are like the core team. They're like, you're my team. Like we have meetings, we talk, it's like we do Slack, we go back and forth and do the whole thing. And a part of like one of the, the mantras of sorts that I find myself saying with great regularity is if it doesn't create greater amounts of uh, simplicity, efficiency, and joy, I'm not interested. Not interested. And I feel like that's something that, that's, that's been something. And there's more, there can be more to that. Life doesn't just need to be ease, simplicity, no, you know, of course, and joy. Of course. Um, like, I think there's a lot of things. And I, like, I, I, I crave hard things, uh, like very much. Um, but within that, I think that the, the other side of that and, and like the, the common mantra of Western culture, not villainizing it, but is, you know, success at all costs, more, uh, more. And that's based off of, you know, I think like the deep underpinnings of what the system is as a whole, not wrong, not a moralistic thing. But I think we come from a place of once you get to a point of feeling like, ah, you've arrived, it's like you get 30 seconds of savoring and then you're like more. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> you know, and so. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I think if we, if we, pan back, we just have to have one person who gets consciousness there in your social group who can have this conversation. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to really change or, or help people to identify that, that has to happen on a peer group level, you know, where people are like, Hey, you know, you've got to ride a mountain bike or let's go hike together or come over on the sauna on Tuesday and let's chill out or you know, we, we have to be able to have those conversations of vulnerability and, uh, hey, I'm out of control here. And what the hell are you doing with your life? You know, and I don't yeah. think we're structured. I think suddenly when you view, you know, um, if I take a, a lesson from, uh, you know, Juliet and I are agnostic, I would say atheist. We've grown up my with, you know, church in our life and have recognized that. People are what's most important. All the values are there, but uh, classic religion hasn't served us in that way. That's what I'll say. And again, not trying to be f defensive wishy-washy, but I do have a lot of friends for whom it serves them very well, and their communities are very strong. And every when I'm there, I drop right into their community, and I'm part of their dialogue, and you know because. When people get together once a week and discuss their lives or, I mean, there's real potential for a mechanism of self-reflect, a mechanism of, of community controls and community inputs. That's very, very powerful of sharing resources, of, of barn building. And I think you can go around the world and be like, oh, I, I see how this used to serve us, especially when there was, a, you know, we're into Yuval Harari now, a lot more war, a lot more pestilence, and a lot more famine. You know, we needed structures to bind people together to get work done. And suddenly, you know, I can go to 7-Eleven and for $5 buy 20,000 calories. So that's not really yeah. the issue. And, um, you know, I can sit on my car and stream the world to my phone, you know, unlimited. That's not the issue. I can have these lazy experiences of belonging on the Internet to a truck. You know, that's, that's no longer the issue. So what we're going to have to think about, you know, going forward is, am I that person in my friend group? And I really think that's the, the level. It's interesting for me to watch my oldest daughter, Georgia, who's turning 17 in a month, um, this month. She's looking at colleges, and I am so proud of the kind of person she is becoming. This is a kid who volunteers. She tutors. She has a couple jobs. She's captain of the water pole team. She's starting to. She loves to bake and cook. She's starting to. We did a training session yesterday. We all skied. She's up here with her boyfriend and our other daughter, and we all skied yesterday for a couple hours. And then we all trained together. And I was like, "Damn, Georgia! Like she can press and snatch and kettlebell swing and row, and she knows how to move her body and train her body, and kind of has a framework for that." And and one of the things that we've discussed is. She's like, boy, I am ready for spring break. And I was like, perfect. It's time to hit the brakes in a real way. 
you know, she's studying for the SATs. And, and you know, I think sometimes we're, some of us are afraid to work and actually have a fulfilled life. And that fulfilled life is actually, believe it or not, is a lot of work. I think Gandhi was really onto something when he was like, you just can't be idle. Like, you need to make thread. You need to do something. I think human beings we're not supposed to have infinite free time trying to get ourselves organized and, and amused. I think we should be thinking about what it looks like to have a really full life. And usually that's a lot more service and a lot more work than most of us are willing to adopt. And so I'm seeing this and then she's like super happy kid and has a sense of, of agency and she's starting another business. And you know what I mean? And what I'm seeing is now when she's on the brakes, she's on the brakes. And uh, you know, when she's, yeah. when she's off, she's really enjoying being off. But you know, uh, the first order of business, I'm like, well, can you do this in your own tribe and community and self? Can you do this with your kids? And then how do you begin to shape that? Because I think that's the problem that the glacial pace of change is as fast as we can go. It is a generation to generation, person to person technology. And we, you know, as long as we keep whipping ourselves into technology change, we are going to always be struggling with this whipsaw of how long it takes to transform ourselves, transform our communities, transform our families, generation to generation, with we're being crushed by the fact that we can buy 10,000 calories for $3. Yeah. And when I say, uh, that our, our kind of like mantra is joy. I think that that can be kind of feel like a little, like a fluffy, like, oh boy, this guy. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying with that isn't to do less and isn't like, like for me doing less is, is like anti-joy. You know, so I want to do all of the things. I want to talk to all the people. I want to write all the books. I want to learn yeah, all the things. Yeah. I want to like travel all the places. I want, I want to make all the mistakes. I want to learn from, like, I want to like, wow, like I want to no. go. If any, anyone, you let know. me just be clear, I, I'm not uh, intimating at all, and anyone understands how you have hustled and grinded. In fact, what I'll say is that all the interesting people in our life who are stoked operate in the same way, where they are yeah. you know, members of a community and members of a society, and then you know, on the weekends, it's not hang around and drink and watch football. It's wilderness, right. experience. And I think someone said... It was they were talking about sort of, I don't remember who it was, you know, is it about, um, you know, it's not freedom from obligation even, it's that people are looking for the experience of being alive. That's the thing. Yeah. How do I feel more? And feeling exhausted is a cool feeling, you know, feeling like you've been a part of something. And that's why these... You know, you want to see, you know, why is that Spartan race with Joe DeSena, why is that so such a powerful experience? Because people did it with a bunch of other people. And maybe the only time they had any unconditional positive regard and they're a little bit tired and a little bit scared. And suddenly you're calling into the greatness of your life and you're not having to wait for a catastrophe yeah. to come around of cancer or injury or trauma to begin to reconsider those things. How do we feel more alive? And, and you nailed it. Joyfulness can be all those things and being around other people who are stoked is, you know, that's our word for it, stoked. Yeah, and then there's a big difference and there's specific questions that are more kind of like anatomy, physiology, PT related stuff that I want to get into, but um, there is a difference between acute exhaustion and chronic exhaustion. And when, if you're if you're running a broken what I would I would categorize as broken operating system, more just for more sake to to fill up some deep insatiable urge to be validated or loved or whatever the thing is, yeah. Um, yeah. I think is where most of that comes from, which is so beautiful, and there's nothing wrong with that. And being honest with that, I think is like a beautiful path towards actually feeling fulfilled, maybe for the first time ever. Um, you know, but so that that acute exhaustion is fucking brilliant. When you're in this like banal, gray, chronic, you know, I just feel oh, that's the thing. And then it's like, okay, well, then the conversation is like, okay, what kind of deadlifts are you doing? What kind of squats are you doing? What kind of, you know, whatever. It's like the, the root of what gets you to do the damn deadlift. Like that's, I think that's such, a, such an important conversation. You know, and I think that there's all of, all of the different, 
spokes on the wheel are are are, uh, are valuable in that. Um, can I ask you a specific people, question? You know, oh, go, go, look, look, yeah, yeah, please. Hang on. Yeah. I was just going to say that people <laughs> ask this all the time. Why do we like, like to get hot and cold, right? Yeah. And sometimes Juliet and I just say, because we're entertained, we really suffer. You know, it's like, I'm like, yes, it's probably range of motion for my soft tissues, <laughs> you know, my vasculature. It's heat shock proteins. I'm like, we have all that physiology, but I'm like, man, I get cold and I freak out a little bit and I have to have a negotiate with myself. And then I get so hot that I want to vomit in the sauna. And, and on those ends, sort of like Jill and I are like, wow, we're just feeling a lot of feeling. And mm -hmm. when we bring people who don't have a lot of that feeling into our world, they really trip out on those experiences like they don't like being cold and they don't like being uncomfortable and Juliet and I are like uncomfortable is where we live yeah <laughs> I mean yeah. I think I think exactly what you're saying there it's true yeah yeah um, all right so back to the, the the bullet point questions that I actually am very interested in your opinion on uh, one would be the concept of stretching I think there's certain words like that that get thrown mm -hmm. around and they're very, there's, there's not really an objective meaning to them. That's right. um, each person has a different perception of what the t concept of stretching is. I'd be curious your perception of what uh, defining stretching and then also coming into, um, well, we could just start there. Uh, like what is stretching? Well, you know, what we should define is what the purpose of stretching is. Yeah. I think that's really where we need to go. What am I attempting to do? So if I just say the word core, you have some, some term. It's why no one uses the word core anymore. No one in the real world because we're like, well, I don't even know what that means. Are you saying, do I have a six pack? Yes, I do. So I have, must have a strong core. Yeah. Um, are you talking about my, you know, my sense of rootedness in my community? That's my, you know. So let's, instead of getting kind of caught up in there, let's ask the question of like, what's our intention with stretching. Mm. And I think what people are saying is, I want to be in less pain. Okay. That, so that's a valid, valid conversation. And I think that's why most people would say, this is why I stretch. I want to be in less pain or I want to prevent pain. Those are two of the reasons I think. So suddenly we can say, well, if I pull on a tissue, does that give me those things? And it turns out, I think through people's experience, it does not, it does not necessarily give you less pain. And it does, definitely does not prevent pain. And uh, you just run that experiment. Ask everyone who knows, should you stretch? Everyone's like, yes, you should stretch. And you're like, do you stretch? No, I don't stretch. And so I think human beings are very clever about doing what works and repeating what works and then not doing, and they stop doing what doesn't work. If I ask athletes, do you stretch? They're like, it didn't make me a better athlete. I'm like, okay, that's really interesting. So, you know, I tend to use the word, like flexibility, I think, describes the properties of a rubber hose. And if you looked at the masters of physical therapy, I mean, the old school masters of the first gen, I'll call them really first gen physical therapists. I'm a second, you know, third gen physical therapist, um, body therapist, whatever. I don't even know what physical therapy is anymore. But the idea here is um, I don't necessarily want you to be all stretched out. That seems kind of like a nightmare. I want you to be springy. And I would say that I've never really stretched anyone in my life. So if we get into the weeds on this thing, you know, is this just input, non-threatening input to the brain? Does it feel good temporarily? Sure. But if we go to our communities where people tend to be very lax and spend a lot of time passively at end range, like our yogis, they have their own sets of dysfunctions pulling on there. And you can see someone like Jill Miller of her work in yoga tune-up has really had to go back in and say, hey, stop just being passive and in range of these things. You've got to have this other input, this positional awareness through some soft tissue mobilization, et cetera. Yeah. So I think really what we can ask is, what are we trying to do with stretching? Does it do those things? Well, I would argue that a lot of my work, all of my work is just about giving people normative range. Every doctor agrees, every physical therapist, every chiro, every rolfer agrees. This is how much the human hip should move within a standard deviation. So that's maybe 130 to 135 degrees. It's usually within about five degrees. Sometimes it's a little bit more if it's internal rotation of the hip or something else. But one of the things that we're asking then is why don't you do, why can't you do what your body should be able to do? And I think even Brian McKenzie talked about this. He's like, do you think all zebras run differently because they're all unique? <laughs> Zebras all run the same. Horses run the same. Their gallop changes, their timing changes based on the length of their hooves or the length of their torso, but there's a hidden expression 
about how all people move and not everyone is a unique special snowflake. There are, of course, very few, you know, uh, cases out there where people are, have dysplasia or something genetic going on, which may limit their total range. But those things are actually very, very far, few and far between. I just saw a great research summary that showing and demonstrating that the research does not s support that there are radical changes in people's hips that make them all have some unique squat. Like that is not true. There's, there's, the hip is, you know, by the time you look at the pelvis and the femur and how much rotation happens in the femur and how much rotation happens at the tibia and all the other ways of correcting that, we see that most people can stand with their feet straight and walk with their feet straight and squat with their feet straight. Yep. You just can't do it because you don't have access to your range of motion. So if we're talking about restoring your native ranges of motion, then we can now say, well, what tools do I have available to me for this? And what we saw for a long time was, you know, it was all muscles, 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 trigger point, trigger point, trigger point. Well, it turns out trigger points are well validated, well researched, and that may be a reason why your nervous system can't access your muscle physiology. Well, it turns out, if, you know, people have been on to the fascia tip for a minute, you know, present company excluded. You know, you may, may or may not know something about fascia there. Um, but it turns out that you don't have a working model of human beings until you include fascia. And now I'm like, let me introduce you to Chinese acupuncture and the meridian theory and springiness. And, you know, so you have to address the fascia. Well, I came out of a tradition that looked heavily at joint capsules and the joint and what's the joint restriction. And the joint may be the, the big place where the brain is putting the big boulders together, but it's connected by the fascia and position sense. So we have to address that. Well, there's also a whole lot of technique based on what is good movement. And you, you can't say all movement is equal because as soon as your movement does not hold at speed or at, let's say, uh, hard cardiorespiratory demand, if I can't add speed to your, that speed is the big change, then all of a sudden I'm like, well, maybe that's a less valid movement expression, right? That, val that, that way you're moving doesn't hold true across all demand. So maybe this technique does. And it actually goes along with how the body it's, exposes itself and how the body's organized. And then we can look at, well, is this just an environmental problem? Because you don't sleep, your brain thinks you're threatened, you're, you're highly inflamed and hypohydrated, and you have tissues that just don't work at a biological level. We have healthier tissues and we have less healthy tissues. And if I'm going to load the crap out of your Achilles, boy, I sure would like that Achilles to have all the nutrients it needs to be a kit an Achilles and handle the loading. So suddenly we take this systems approach and I would say any one of those ways in is a valid way to what? Improve your range of motion, restore your range of motion, improve your movement efficiency and movement economy. And the thing that we can really talk about is does this give you more choice and more movement access? Does this movement solution we're giving you give you better transfer of a movement solution to some new skill? Like why do we train? Well, it's not just to have bigger muscles and stronger tissues. Sorry, you know, that's not the reason we train. You know, movement is a behavior that we're learning and reinforcing. And what I would argue is that the most important thing we're doing in the gym is reinforcing and practicing movement behavior under different conditions. And then we do see physiologic adaptation to that, but ultimately that's why we're in the gym, so that I can go out and skateboard more effectively or swim more effectively. Not just because I'm stronger, I can now pull on the water harder. That's a really reductive way of looking at this. So if stretching fits into changing some aspect of that tissue, movement, environmental system, then I'm like, oh, maybe that's a valid technique, mm. right? If self-mobilization, rolling on a roller or a ball or doing a band distraction or tempo work or isometric work or getting more sleep, all of those things are valid to change or input the movement system so that we can have a, a movement outcome. But suddenly, if I mobilize your soft tissues and it doesn't restore your range of motion, I don't think, hey, it's not that that didn't work. That made me less sore from my workout that maybe even helped with my pain, that reperfused, and brought blood flow and hydration back to tissues that needed it. Um, for people who were really shut down, it gave them input so they could feel their back again for the first time safely, right? So they could do something else. But if we focus on everything is about restoring movement and re improving the body's ability to generate movement, 
then I'm like, yes, stretching can be part of that narrative. But unless we have clear goalposts of what is normative range and what we expect, then I'm just pulling on something. And when it doesn't work, what I think is, oh, this is an invalid technique. Yeah. I, and it's taken me a long time to be able to summarize that. That's succinctly. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I think that the thing that's, uh, well, there's a lot of things I want to say, but to stay more concise, um, I'd be interested in your perception of the difference between, I'm kind of making this term up, but like structural elongation or, or changing mm. of say like the sarcomeres, you know, or like the units of the muscle to create more length to, to allow or potentiate greater dorsiflexion, for example. And so if a person has been in like high heeled shoes for a long time, uh, there could be structural change literally to the length of the units of that, that yeah. muscle that caused that. It's, it's literally, it's like, okay, now that's at a, at a, at a, a, a biological level, that, that is who you are. You're a, you know, you, you lack that range of motion. That's right. And, and then there's another lane that's interesting. And this kind of gets back into like the Moshe Feldenkrais stuff. Um, you know, he, he refers to the, the idea, the story of who we think we are as, like, as the mask self. You know, so we have like our, our self-education you know, it's like the inherent self. He calls it the immutable self. You know, and then there's the stories that we pack on and we learn. It's and it's our compensatory, you know, safety mechanisms or our bracings or our, you know, the world's whatever the world's whatever it is, and that affects the uh, regulation of our autonomic nervous system and our like our like autonom also true. Our autonomic baseline and the tonicity of our tissues, and so it, I think there's an interesting intersection that I'd be curious to hear just your, 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 your thoughts on in general. It's like there's the story of the self that affects the regulation of the nervous system, which affects your capacity for range of motion. And then there's the structural objective reality of the tissue. And the bridge between them, I think, is, is interesting. You know? uh, and what I'll tell you and, is and that... And please correct as well if I just said a bunch of bullshit. No, uh, I would say... Um, the problem potentially with all the both of those sides of the argument mm -hmm. is that it it gives me unadorned and naked apologetics mm. this is who i am i'm, I'm just stiff mm. oh okay right or you know well how can i change that um you know this story of myself how how do i you know th those things i think are both true on both sides mm. and you know oftentimes when we talk about threat and pain, I talk about from top-down regulation and bottom-up regulation. Moshe also said it's all about the brain. It's all about the nervous system all the time. Yeah. So when we begin to view it that way, I mean, even I've shifted in the last 10 years how I discuss this. I'm like, hey, let's get some non-threatening input into your spine. You know, like your brain suddenly like, oh, look, it's safe to take a breath here. Let's take the next step. I mean, maybe that's all we're doing. I look back at my work and I think, am I just prescribing isometrics to people, which makes that the tissues are beginning to be able to generate force at end range. And then the brain says, oh, look, you're safe here. And then there's, the, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. You know, what's, what's happening with voodoo flossing? I think 17 things are happening during voodoo flossing. The only thing that matters is better, same, worse, test, retest. Yep. Did this get us closer to normative range? And more importantly, as you say, the thing in whether we're talking about confidence. I mean, look at someone snowboarding down something or skiing down something that's above their ability. They get stiff, their breathing stops, they get into fear position, they don't react as well. Um, I saw the same thing happening in a documentary about free diving, where this free diver was talking about, well, when he, I think he was French, he's like, when I'm when my family loves me and I'm in a good relationship with my, my girlfriend, then I dive really well. Yep. Everything else, and it's that for him, that subtlety of relationship with his family and his girlfriend affects his, his output. So I think both statements that you are said are true. And it means we need to work on them simultaneously together. Um, I was at uh, Fort Bragg at a summit uh, for the military, for the army, about with all the physicians, all the physical therapists, all the coaches were there trying to solve this musculoskeletal mechanical pain injury problem. How do we improve the system? What are the, what are the key levers where we can have a more robust person? And this, this physical therapist said, hey, I have this woman who torn her ACL, meets all the objective measures of return to sport, but doesn't believe 
that she's ready to return to play or return to her job. What do you think the problem is? I'm like, well, that's failed rehab. Because the limiting factor is her brain thinking that she's safe for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what the reasons are. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what your previous history is. If this is the, the now and your brain won't give you permission, and again, this is how we, you suddenly have to be an expert in, in behavior and cognitive behavioral therapy and how do we grade exposure, whether it's trying to get someone over a fear of driving across a bridge or, or believing that it's safe to squat down or flex their spine again. Now you're deep into pain science and you're deep into the psychology. So, you know, I think the problem is the pendulum swims one way and the other way. Oh, it's all tissues and mechanics. Oh, it's no, it's all the brain. Well, we can do all the tempo squatting and all the squat therapy and all the slow isometrics ever but if your tissues are stiff and you're hypohydrated and you don't eat and you don't have any collagen and you have a genetic predisposition for this then it's just magical thinking that your brain can just overcome your achilles stiffness or the the lack of dorsiflexion right because otherwise i would just be i would become such a master i'd be like and now deadlift 600 my tissues can tolerate it but why can't i generate the force to do that so or why you know so we have to simultaneously have all the inputs from the top down this is why training group matters that i'm safe i'm in a community of people i love and i'm i can explore the boundaries and ranges so i say man if you get injured in the gym something is going wrong because the gym is the only safe environment where we can control all of the narratives. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we can really, we can control it all there. And so if something is going on in the gym, I'm like, well, maybe let's start, let's simplify the system or continue to simplify the system. And what I have come to believe is that the gym is a really wonderful place to come to understand physical self. What's my self-talk when it gets hard? Do you think that's going to be different self-talk when you have to have a difficult conversation? Same self-talk, yeah. right? That I'm going to expose your hip extension and be able to predict what your compensation looks like. What's that going to happen when you're running down a hill? I'm going to see the same thing or playing basketball. So I think, you know, if you've ever done Feldenkrais, you're on the ground doing movement, feeling, reconnecting, learning things are safe. That's cool. But eventually you need to stand up and show me that that transfers under load, under power, with a kettlebell, sprinting up a hill, playing NFL. Yep. And what you realize is it's an incomplete practice un unto of itself. But suddenly if you're only deadlifting and power cleaning and running into things, you may have also incomplete practice. So how do we begin to scape, shape, scope our practices so that we can have this outcome. And I would suggest that just restoring your baseline range of motion and access there is a good place to start. And, but you, it is very much about the brain and it is very much about the tissue health. And of course, as we've already talked about, those things interact with one another. If I, nothing hurts, I'm more likely to move. If I believe it's going to hurt, I'm less likely to move. Both, both statements are true. Yeah. And so to uh, avoid the uh, self-victimization and the apologetics and all the things in relation to the, the length, structural length of, of muscle tissues changing. I, I'm, it's, I'm saying that in the, in the opposite way. I'm saying you're a, a bioplastic being that you yes. elongated yourself through sarcomere genesis. You sarcomere genesized yourself into having, you know, longer tissue. You can also sarcomere all the size yourself into the chewing of the chewing back of that and 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 rechanging it or changing the structure and so that's like i just think that's just amazing you know and then it's amazing <laughs> how about this carl, <laughs> carl rogers carl rogers thought you could reinvent yourself every day you could wake up yeah. and choose to be a different person yeah. right so that is true and if that's true why can't it be true that i can reshape my whole body mm -hmm. The Rolfers were the first people I knew, the structural integration people were the first people I ever knew who took a photo before six months, a year, and 18 months. And guess what? People begin to change. Yep. And where the tissues pull on the bones changes. You can actually look different on radiograph. Basically, your bones will remodel as the stresses on them change. That shouldn't be surprising to us at all. That's the same thing about the brain. So if, the, if that is our operating assumption, that I can constantly change, have input, then the only real magic here is time under tension, yep. practice, repetition, and that you're going to have to 
you can't stretch your way out of that. You're going to have to load that Achilles, and then you're going to have to engage in a bit behaviors that reshape that and tell your brain, oh, this is who we are now. We used to be high heel Kel, and now we are, you know, dorsiflexion in hip extension Kel, right? And I better eat to make sure that I have all of those things on, and I better sleep so that I can have a great adaptation response. Holy crap, you're saying that human being is complex. I'm saying it's more complex than you possibly can imagine. But if you just started by sitting on the ground and being barefoot a little bit, some of this will happen in the background. Yeah, and I think that- A lot of it will, most of it does. Right, yeah, we're, we're self-emerging systems. You know, like you just place, place the human organism into the proper environmental conditions and get out of your conscious mind and allow yourself to form into that environment. And it's like, boom, that's every elite performer athlete ever. They've never thought about what they're doing as they're doing the thing as you're pe- that you're paying to watch them do. It's never happened. Maybe it's happened, That's right. you know. But for the mo- you know the, the the vast majority of the time when Sean White or Kelly Slater or whatever is doing their thing, there's no there's no conscious. Maybe little bits of conscious might peek in for a moment, but the vast majority is just locking in and allowing that like that that self emergence, you know. And so then it's like After you got to be thousands. Correct. 10,000s yes. of small micro step, Correct. right? And, and then, you know, if you want to draw bamboo, what do they say? You know, draw bamboo, draw bamboo for 10 years, become a bamboo, then forget about bamboo when you draw. Right. I mean, I think that's really, all of it. I'm like, oh, there it is again. Someone nailed it. Yeah. So now we can begin to ask, well, what does that look like? Well, I would suggest the kids need to sit on the ground a little bit more that we need more recess and play, that we want to create an environment where the body begins to have this exposure of safety, of play, of understanding. So, you know, one of the ways that we describe this for Juliet and I is we don't want people's worlds to get smaller as they age. Hmm. And typically that's what happens. And let me give you a really gnarly example. Uh, I worked a lot in the hospital when I was a young physio student and I would see people get sick and transition to a smaller room and then transition, get sicker, and transition to a smaller room. And eventually they were in the ICU with no windows, or maybe there was one window. (laughs) But no contact, and the world just got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And one of the things that we see, even as people age, is like, oh, I don't do that anymore. Why don't you do that thing anymore? You know, well, like, you know, range of motion is one of the easiest things to keep an eye on. You know, you can do yoga forever, and remind your body to have access to your tissues forever. That's, that's an easy thing. Not about strength, not about power, not about VO2, just can you put your arms over your head? And if you go to an airport and watch people put their arms in the scanner, they cannot put their arms over their head. So, you know, the idea here, you know, we saw Juliet's mom, there was a time where she was like, I don't want to ride a bike, I don't feel safe. Like, she suddenly had removed bike riding from her world, her world got a little bit smaller. Adults stop liking to run because it doesn't feel good. And that's a reasonable thing to do. So what are the behaviors that we could give so that someone can always feel like, yes, I would like to uh, play some basketball or throw the Frisbee. Yeah. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean run straight. It means run. And what I would suggest is that we're always looking for inputs in Juliet in my life where we can keep our movement choices and what we choose to do with that movement as wide and vast as possible. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Do you, do you got to go very soon? I, I'm... Uh... Okay, cool. No. All right. Um, so I think it's interesting. I, I know that you've seen this. You probably actually even have this with your, in your own experience. But some people get really um, attached to their kettlebells. They like personify them. <laughs> they like yes. you do, do draw faces on them. They like, it's, like a, it's like, oh, yeah, it's like my relationship. And I think that that's actually so true in what the, the, um, the incorporation of load bearing while you're going through your ranges of motion because it's providing you the feedback to gain relationship of where you actually are in space. Yes. And acknowledging yes. the difference between just wily hypermobility flexibility and actual integrity through a full range of motion. And I, I think that's something do you is that is that do you align with that? One hundred percent. You know, uh, Mel Sif of Super Training one of the godfathers of really the modern strength conditioning age was like, look, I have plenty, plenty of bodybuilders with quote unquote dysfunctional posture, thoracic typhosis. You can hand them something, nothing changes. They can ventilate there. They've, that stiffness serves them well, right? And nothing, and they're really stable and pain-free. 
may not ever have pain. Simultaneously, I can have these Pilates masters who come in and you hand them something heavy and their, their organization and their ability to maintain organization falls apart under a little load, a little car respiratory demand. Mm. So exactly what you're saying, integrity through motion, integrity through load. We just had Stacy Sims, Dr. Stacy Sims, who's the preeminent researcher on sex differences in, in sport on our podcast. And she's talking about her new book, you know, about menopause. And, you know, really we're looking at, we have to be under some load. And now we're back at Phillip Beach that we used to carry around his term resources. You would put things on your back, yeah. you carried your baby, you carried the, you know, you, oh, everyone hunts and here, carry this thing. And now we're moving. So carrying things is such a way of loading. Suddenly you're like, oh, I start to understand we've got to be under some load. And that kettlebell can be that, that fetished idol, that totem that allows you to have access to that because it's pretty simple. I mean, a kettlebell in every kitchen would solve a whole lot of problems in the world, wouldn't it? Yeah, and so the reason I bring that up. A, kitchen, a chicken in every pot, yeah. a kettlebell in every kitchen. The reason I bring that up and the, the relationship part is uh, this, this will tie back to, to pain, which I'd love to have your working definition of pain as well, because I think that's a really interesting subjective concept. Um, but the uh, providing a person the feedback to, under, to, to feel the production of intra-abdominal pressure and feel the you know that like the, the, your torso has the potential to become like this weight bearing barrel that becomes an intermediary between the lower body and the upper body that is yeah. that is something that very few people on the planet have any relationship to and it is one of the primary pillars or keys to your overall strength longevity health well-being like everything that's what do you think about that? <laughs> I would say that a better tool than a kettlebell is a sandbag. Yeah. Well, I was, like, oh, sorry, really I was, I was thinking a weightlifting it. belt. Sorry, that's what I, I might have oh, left that oh. part. So, so, so the introduction of, of, of wearing a belt or even just having a buddy say, like, cool, can you breathe? Yeah, suddenly your you're, you're like, what? what? <laughs> right. All right, now try squatting with that. <laughs> what? Oh, now, all right, now do a push up. <laughs> that same thing where you're creating that pressure and that stabilization. Now do anything, throw a punch throw a kick, like just understand that as a, as a, a, yes. a, a tool to have access to. Well, you know, Philip Beach, we'll come back to Philip Beach, describes the, the spine as a radial contractile field, which I love. Hmm. Looking at, it's about the reason we have trunk. Yes, it might be to maintain relationship and transfer energy between the hip to the leg. That, sure. Now we're into spinal engine and yada, yada, yada. But what we could talk about is its real design is to maintain the length and integrity of the spinal system. Hmm. The, 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 it's all about maintaining the length and integrity of that tube that contains the brain. Hmm. And um, what you're saying is, wow, very few of us sometimes have an experience where we know how to be organized at the appropriate time. So we don't use bracing anymore. We don't use neutral anymore because those words became like corn stretching. They were not, and there were words, honestly, that our generation inherited from the people in front of us. Mm. And they just didn't serve us very well. Like we don't say movement fault anymore. I'm like, that's a compensation because you don't have access or it's an inefficiency or right. It's not good or bad. It's just less effective. And what you're seeing is at the heart of this is why am I existing in a, an environment where I don't have access to carry something heavy around? Guarantee you kids who grew up on farms have plenty of understanding of what this looks like. Yeah. Carry this baby goat back to the herd, you'll understand exactly what's up when you're nine years old and you have to, to manage that. And you know, So a lot of these things are exactly as you're saying, we're having to put in these really modern constructs to teach foundational and fundamental aspects of being a human and, and being able to create the right stiffness and the right ventilation with a better organization. Well, that's the definition of good training. That's I just introduced you to Pilates right there. That's yoga, yeah. right? And uh, that's that's powerlifting and, and strong person stuff. So you're you're absolutely right that when people begin to feel more and understand more, whew, and no wonder, you know, is it Socrates or Plato is like a, a man who doesn't understand that his body is, you know, and the glory of power of his, yeah. you know, his physical person is really missing out on something. People have been talking about this for a long time, mm. that there are really good ways, unless you grew up in the jungle carrying stuff, this is not going to, you know, I remember watching um, 
uh, the live action Jungle Book and watching the actor kid jump down from a tree and then run through the woods away from Aquila or, you know, from the wolf. And uh, his arches are collapsed and the kid runs like, a, I was like, no way. That kid would be die dead in two seconds. I was like, here's not an organism that it was adaptive to climbing and jumping and swinging. Like, here's an actor kid who's a really fine actor trying to figure out what it's like to run and move. And so, you know, what's interesting, the thing you're saying is when you begin to look at the kernel of truth underneath this, I was just at the Arnold um, Sports Festival in Columbus a month ago or so, and Ed Cohn, who's one of the greatest powerlifters of our generation, he's such a good guy, and we've become friends, and he's known as the GOAT, the greatest of all time, comes up behind me and puts his hand on my back, and he's like, nice erectors. Like, the first thing he checked on me was, am I loading my spine? Am I loading my trunk enough? And he, you know, just commented that by grabbing my erectors, you know? And um, so I think when we look at the limiting factors to people being successful or being pain-free or being durable, the ability to create stiffness and have a functioning trunk, no wonder the breath practice is so important. Yeah. No wonder the pelvic floor is so important. No wonder teaching people how to create stiffness in this trunk. If you do the Pilates Daily 100, that is not about abs. That's learning how to be stiff and breathe at the same time. That's what that drill is really about. Mm. And so suddenly you're like, holy crap, everything is about spine first or protecting the integrity of the nervous system because that is the biggest limiter and threat to your body. Yeah. I either have two questions or one question, depending upon your time. How, what's... Oh, let's do two. Okay, cool. More is better. Oh, good. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So I would love to get into your perspective on uh, pain because, again, it's, it's mm. one of those words that it's like it's, it's, it means something different to everybody. You know, and there's the, the bio, psycho, social lens on it that it's kind of like this integrated human, like your, you know, your finances do affect your level of pain or your nervous system <laughs> sensitization, um, you know, or there could be a more exclusively like biomechanical lens that it's just friction and inflammation in the joint that's causing the nerve endings to go wild and send you the signal that you need to change, you know, do, do things different. Um, what where where does your mind go when I just say blunt like what is pain Kelly you know coming from a sports performance environment where uh, if you take one of the athletes I get to work with and it's a good friend of mine her name's Kate Courtney she's a world champion Olympian mountain biker one of the best bikers ever if I dropped into her brain in a World Cup mountain bike race I would perish mm -hmm. from the pain the suffering, the pain, I would just perish. Wouldn't be able to take it at a level of suffering that she's putting herself through to win these races. That's, that's how gnarly it is. And simultaneously, she has come to believe that that's safe. She knows how to handle that. She's a great and exposed to her brain where her body is literally dying and she's getting every signal to stop and save the resources and she's able to say, oh, this is my job. I'm going to immolate myself, set myself on fire, and then race faster than the other girl. And I can out-suffer and out-hurt the other girl. So from a human performance perspective, pain is part of a training stimulus, uncomfortableness, whatever we describe it as. And we've always had to deal with discomfort, pain, um, whatever, again, whatever language is not triggering to you as part of our training environment. Because if we don't manage it, because if I go to the gym and I'm like, whose knees hurt? Everyone raises their hand. I go into high schools, I'm like, whose shoulder hurts and whose back hurts? Like, it, it's a part of the human condition. So I really have appreciated what um, Perry Nicholson says yeah, about it, of stop chasing pain. And he says, pain is a request for change. So I'm, I'm quoting him, and I'm sure it's not his original thing. But what we've always come to believe around pain is that it's more signaling to yourself about the state of yourself. And when you begin to think of it in those terms, then it's, it's a really powerful teaching understanding model. Brian McKenzie used to have a shirt that said, pain is my companion. And um, what suddenly is if you show up at the, at the gym and you're sucking today or on the mountain bike ride, I'm like, what's going on? You're like, well, I drank three pitchers of beer and smashed a pizza and I got into a fight with my wife and sleep. I'm like, oh. 
your wattage sucks today because of these outputs. But if I'm like, I show up today and like, you're like, my knee hurts. I'm like, well, what happened? And you're like, I don't know. I probably have knee cancer. I've torn my meniscus or like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, so suddenly if we can begin to wrap our heads around pain as information and request for change, then I can become curious about what that is. Well, it turns out I once again have this top-down approach that I sleep, don't I feel safe, am I stressed? All those things affect my brain's interpretation of what's going on with the tissues. And bottom up, if I have a hypohydrated, stiff tissue, something is going on, it's, it's congested, all of those things can be sensitizers. So I can either have some input from the bottom or input from the top, and theoretically, we like to try to have inputs from both. But what I want everyone to understand, and, and don't get me wrong, we're going to talk about chronic pain and persistent pain in a second, is that um, pain is this is how your brain is interpreting something about what's going on with your body. So your knee doesn't generate pain signals. And I've been in enough surgeries and seen enough hips and knees that look like trash cans on fire mm -hmm. and they're not painful. So a lot of times we can buffer this. I've seen people who have terrible herniated discs, no pain. In fact, they go on to set world records with those herniated discs. So there's something about my, my genetics, my previous exposure, my readiness in terms of my health, um, my family's belief about pain, early exposure as a kid, that, or myself of sense of effic efficacy and control. Hey, well, I know what to do about this, it's no big deal. All of those things are super valid. And what I'll say is, it's been, the way we've managed it has been really not in favor of the person. We think that pain is the low bar. And oftentimes, look, one of the things, the feedbacks we get around the ready state in our app and all our work is that people are like, you used to have pain. I just got this thing on yesterday. This guy was like, hey, I was on opiates for years, and now I have no pain doing your program. I'm off all the meds. And all we did for that person, maybe, check this out. Here's a hypothesis. We restored his range of motion, or we improved his range of motion, and that was enough for his brain to go, oh, this is different. Yep. That's not the old guy. This is the new guy. And sometimes it can be as easy as that, but the brain is like, oh, this is different. This is something else because the brain recognizes patterns very, 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 very well. Like it's a pattern recognition machine. So suddenly you can extend your hip more and you have less tension in the system and your fascia slides. Your brain is like, mm, I don't know who this guy is, but I like it. And so it de-threatens that. All of a sudden a beautiful person walks into your room and all of a sudden your pain is gone and that maps, and then you stopped eating cookies every day, and whatever it is, all of those things are valid. But we have to talk top down, and we have to talk bottom up, yeah. and both of those things. And one of the things that I want people to understand is that if you have musculoskeletal pain or pain with movement, then one of the things that we can do is go ahead and try to change some aspect of your movement system, give you more movement permission, open up the windows, give you, turn on more lights in the room, and then that may be enough to desensitize that. And simultaneously, you know, a few years ago, I got trashed by the physical therapy community because they were like, you know, I was hammering on sleep. Got to sleep, got to sleep, got to sleep. And they were like, eh, sleep, 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 sleep. And then, of course, turns out sleep is a huge sensitizer. If you're not slept, you're more likely to experience what your body is experiencing as interpret that as uncomfortableness, as discomfort, as pain. And it's to the point now where if someone shows up with persistent pain or chronic pain, I make them track their sleep. Because once again, if the brain is in a less threatened state, it's more tolerant of your silly bullshit. That's what I'll say. So, but there's a lot we can do from the bottom up that can really impact how your brain is perceiving what's going on in the tissues. And here's an example. When people have surgeries, they get a lot of swelling. That swelling can be nosogenic. I don't know if you've heard that word, but I just made it up. It means it can be a generator of pain. Yeah a sensitizer. But if we manage the swelling, people oftentimes don't have any pain or they have a lot less discomfort just because we manage the swelling. Which again leads me to believe this bottom up approach works and top down approach works. And having a conversation about pain sometimes is really important because if you get into chronic pain or persistent pain, the body that body keeps a score, trauma, all of those things. Um, I was working with some uh, special operations Navy guys who are going to be sent back to Yemen 
and three of them developed stomach bleeds before they'd even deployed because Yemen was such a stressful environment the last time they were there. Just knowing they were going back there, the brain's like, oh, I know what this is. We're going back to Yemen. Turn on all the stress. So they all ended up with stomach bleeds before that even left. So let's acknowledge, appreciate that the brain top down, hugely important. Can't, can't fake that. And the bottom up, having a healthy tissue system body, healthy gut, probably matters as much as what, as what your brain does. Yeah. So I think both sides are really important. Yeah, I think it's really, um, it's just so interesting. The, I mean, you've heard all of the, the different stories of, um, you know, there's obviously phantom limb, you know, it's like your, your hand hurts and you don't objectively have a hand. Um, there's the, the, the studies that they've done with like different temperature, um, what was it? Different temperature rods, I think. And then, or no, no, it was oh, cold, yeah. cold rod. It was, a, it was consistent temperature, cold you rod. You think you're burning. Yeah. Ah! If you send, if you, if you show a person a red light, suddenly that, that static temperature rod becomes hot. If you show them a green light saying you're safe, it's fine. You have all this history and filter and story of what the, of what, oh, sorry, a blue light. You have all this filter around what blue light means. You're like, ah, wow, this is all right. <laughs> You know, it's so, and, and so it's just, a, you know, it's, it's, it's just so darn, darn interesting. Um, I, I, well, well please. Y- y- I think you're right. The, 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 I would say that the story is part of this. And again, agency, efficacy, all of that matters. I think, you know, if you get into the, you know, some of the marketing research that, you know, this pill is blue, so it's more effective than this white pill. Yeah. I mean, our brains are that perceptive of what's going on. Um, you know, we have immense power to manage. This is why I say to a lot of people, I'm like, pain is the low bar. We can, we have a lot of tools to help you manage this top down, bottom up. And you're already trying to manage it. You're managing it with THC and alcohol and opiates and, and sex and food and you're self-soothing. So suddenly we realize, oh, people are just self-soothing. And this is why it's so important that we begin to expand the conversation about who owns pain. Pain is not a medical problem. If you have so much pain you can't do your job or occupy your role in society or the family, then it's a medical problem. If your knee hurts after this run or your back hurts after working your job, that's not a medical problem. That's a human being problem. That means that is in your wheelhouse. And if you just get up and do a Goscue stuff or you load the fascia or you're doing some you know, Eldoas, or you mobilize, or you do a breath, I don't care what it is. Again, does this restore my ability to move or not? And suddenly what you realize is, well, if I don't have access to that, or my brain thinks that I, I'm unsafe in that position, and sometimes you just rode your bike so much, and now you your tissues have a higher tone because it's easier to hold that flexed hip position, and a little tissue restoration in your iliacus is all it takes, and your back, your back feels great. Yeah. So what's going on there? So I think that's really where we need to re-empower people and reimagine, hey, it's we want you to jump on that pain right away, and here are all these tools available to you. Which ones work for you? Great. Next time that happens give that a try if not we have a different set of tools yeah so i i have we've been finishing the podcasts with a specific question that we place into the align community which is absolutely free i'll provide the links and all the all all the all the things to that afterwards so this particular question um that will be found over there or be found over there um i'd be curious if you have like a, a a list of like your top three um, practices or suggestions if a person is experiencing, say, back pain, uh, hip pain, some type of chronic pain that's been like lingering, like the body's not, but there's just this thing, like body's pretty good, but like, like that part behind my, between my scapula and my thoracic spine, like it's still kind of this lingering um, sensation. Uh, where would you start a person to start to investigate that and, and start to navigate you know, a path towards resolution of chronic pain? What is up? I hope you guys have enjoyed this conversation. If you'd like to hear Dr. Kelly's response to this question and much more absolutely free content with Amazing Community, you can jump over to alignpodcast.com slash community for the answer to this question and much more, alignpodcast.com slash community.